Howdy folks, this is Dan Gross and welcome to Extended Harmony for Outside In Music. Outside In Music is a record label and a media company that connects jazz artists with their passionate fan bases. Please visit us at our website, OutsideInMusic.com, where you can see our artists and their recent releases, our podcasts, videos, and links to get in touch with us. Extended Harmony, what you're listening to right now, is a monthly podcast which features musicians in the jazz, blues, and soul umbrella who create original music. And this is produced in conjunction with Nick Finzer's own Over Here podcast. We discuss their musicians' lives, influences, their creative processes, and some advice they'd like to pass along. Joining us today is Danny Rabin, guitarist and co-founder of the jazz rock group Marbin, Mike Catone, trumpet player of Holophoner, Dave Chisholm, who has drawn, written, and composed the soundtrack for a new comic book, Instrumental, and Katie Ernst, a singer, bassist, and composer who has both released solo material and performs and records with her group Twin Talk. Eastman School of Music fans rejoice. Three quarters of the show are Eastman alumni. Thanks for tuning in, and please enjoy this episode of Extended Harmony. First up is Danny Rabin, the guitarist from the jazz rock fusion group Marbin. Danny is originally from Israel, but moved to America and graduated from Berkeley in 2007 with a degree in guitar performance. Marvin's bringing back the word shredding into the popular vernacular through fun melodies played by Danny Markovich on his tiny saxophone and distorted riffs by Danny Rabin. John Nadell on bass and Blake Yurisek on drums round out the lineup. They're hot off recording their latest album, and so we spoke to Danny about Marvin, Gypsy Jazz, and being an independent artist. Danny, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So uh, one thing that jumps out uh, about Marvin, besides their shredding, and we'll, we'll get to the shredding later, is uh, on your biography it says you are actually from Israel. And I think a lot of us probably stateside are wondering, well, what is the musical environment like in Israel, both for the state, the country, and for you specifically? Um, generally, pretty terrible, like every place, uh, like every place in the world recently. You know, yeah. uh, pop is kind of a disease that uh, we have to fight globally. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Israel is interesting in the sense that in the 40s, I guess through the 60s, maybe even the 70s, we had very special kinds of music emerge. Uh, hmm. that I think both me and Danny Markovich are very influenced by. Uh, so, you know, not to bore everybody to, to tears, but like, you know, just kind of an overview of, of Israeli music. I think it would ha- it has some sort of like kind of Eastern European influence in mm-hmm. it that I think you can really hear in uh, some of Marbin's definitely earlier stuff, but our the softer side of our music and our approach for harmony. Uh, and... Our approach to harmony, I think like a lot of the gypsy jazz kind of things that people would assume is in our music because of gypsy jazz, just because our folk music has Mm -hmm. some of those same kind of harmonies that are really derivative, I think, of like Eastern European, Russian folk, some classical music, more like uh, Romantic era stuff like Chopin, those kind of people, the Jews that came from Europe to Israel brought that kind of bag with them. Mm -hmm. Um, But... You know, so growing up, some of that was on the radio, and I really did like some of that kind of music, but um, I wasn't really grown. You know, I wasn't really growing up in some sort of traditional kind of, you know, musical upbringing. I listened to rock, got to thing. You know, I got to the to the style of guitar. I'm playing through metal. Like there was a Metallica concert I went to that was really. Uh, a turning point in my life in the sense that I saw everybody dress up a certain way and I wanted to dress up that way too and that came along with uh, you know the subculture of metal which I was drawn to I think initially because of the fashion also brought you know a, a certain kind of music with it and through the kind of sound that the guitar had in metal I got into guitar and I always loved that high gain saturated sound and that kind of led me on a quest through you know shred to fusion to jazz to marvin yeah and we'll we'll get back to what shred means to marvin specifically but you you uh you brought up uh something that i definitely wanted to touch on with you and i think 
you put it in its historical context well that you know everyone even though israel is the historical homeland of the jewish people it wasn't always a quote unquote state for and as soon as israel was founded as a state people who had been spread out through the jewish diaspora came in and so israeli music does have a lot of that stuff and you mentioned gypsy and i think besides shredding i think people also associate marvin and i think this is because of the videos you post on social media with gypsy so was was the gypsy a an early life thing did you hear that in israeli music and dug it or is this something that kind of happened later in life no no that happened much later yeah, yeah um yeah i i get i heard a lot about mythology about myself through mm. social media that never actually <laughs> happened uh so it's uh it's always surprising to me because i heard some people say oh yeah he's like he has gypsy blood grew up around the fire learning this like and i mean i got into gypsy gypsy jazz about three and a half four years ago when my ex-wife bought me that guitar i still play uh mm. for my for one of my birthdays and uh i just decided i'm gonna take it real seriously because i had all this free time on the road so me and danny just started playing on the street and back in those days nobody would come to our shows you know we played basically for <laughs> empty bars every night and you know just money was a real issue so we mm. uh during the day we'd busk on the street and play for four or five hours you know just gypsy jazz on the street for money before mm -hmm. our show when we were on tour so we really learned how to play this style on the go but my exposure to gypsy jazz i watched sweet and low down that woody mm -hmm. allen movie when i was in high school and i i didn't you know that really opened my mind to it and then i had this dvd of jimmy rosenberg playing in a hotel room with frank vignola Mm. Uh, after their show in Carnegie Hall, and I thought Jimmy was like, you know, the best at shredding that style. Um, and then, uh, you know, over, I, I guess I got into it in recent years, but I think, uh, yeah, people, people trying to get into Gypsy Judge should find that actually encouraging because, you know, I do not have, I'm not, I'm not a gypsy. I, I just learned how to do it pretty quickly. But yeah. I did have uh, the harmonic language to play jazz before i approached it so in that sense my you know my road into it was kind of easier than a lot of people who don't play jazz and want to pick it up because you know i knew like you know the kind of scale chord connection and i could hear what they were doing and it made sense to me in terms of no choices so it was much more of an endeavor of learning how to play technically mm. you know learning the rest stroke technique learning how to and which is you know it's a different it, physically it's very different than playing any other style of guitar because of the picking mm -hmm. uh and it's people a lot of people i hear like you know teachers teaching lessons on this stuff online saying like you don't have to use that thing. it's like ah you don't have to use it you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you're not gonna get a very authentic sound you know if you don't really learn how it's done Right. You know, what is a style? It's the way you make something sound, especially a style like that where you're just celebrating this one dead guy, you know? Right. It's like this whole style is really around Django. You yeah. Know, much more than Bebop is around Charlie Parker. Yeah. And, and you mentioned you and uh, Danny, so he he plays saxophone uh, in, in Marbin. You two started doing this busking, but uh, so Marbin seems to be, anyway, a poor manteau between your last name and Danny's last name. So you went to Berkeley. Oh, yeah, it's it's our band completely. Oh, really? I didn't know that. So uh, so you two went to, well, you went to Berkeley, but now you're uh, in Chicago, correct? Mm -hmm. So how did uh, you and Danny get to know each other, then how did Marbin form? Oh. 2007 I graduated from Berkeley I spent a summer uh, back in Israel we met through a common friend who was a bassist and uh, we actually met a night before we were supposed to play a g our first gig together mm. and um, just like in a cafe in Israel or some silly thing like that and uh, what happened was we started writing together uh, we started writing songs and for me that was a new experience it's very difficult to write with somebody else seriously first of all you have to have a lot of kind of shared aesthetics which we do we we really like it's it's a, we like the same things the same kind of people and the same songs and the same kind of playing to a surprising amount i never mm. had i still to this day i've never met anybody who has a more similar taste in music mm. than uh 
to me than Danny does, you know. Well, you know, if it's like songwriters or lyrics or classical, it's, it's pretty astonishing. We, we really like the same mm -hmm. I think I like Hank Williams slightly better than he does, but he still <laughs> likes him, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, so uh, we really had a lot in common in that sense. And then our writing process was really flowing and we wrote mm. a lot of music. And then in 2008, we moved to, to Chicago. 2009, we put together our first record. 2011, we started touring full-time as Marvin. Right. First album uh, was released by yourself. And then three, uh, you released uh, from Moon June Records. And you say that's by name only. We'll, we'll talk about that. And then your most recent one, and the one you actually just finished recording, you, this, thing is, this thing is hot. You just got done with this thing. A couple days yeah, ago, three, day, three days ago, yeah, yeah. So, uh, cool. well, it's not, it's not ready yet. We'll, we'll be ready in right. about five months, I would say. Cool. So, all the principal recordings done. You just got the post work to do. So, I, I want to do a pick your brain about uh, the difference between being an independent musician and being a musician on a label. There is no difference. <laughs> is it there that is no simple? difference anymore? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the question is what. Unless you're on a very on a major label, mm. um, you know, the a thing you really got to ask yourself, I think, as a musician, if you're if you're crazy enough to attempt to monetize your art, and you're doing something fr fringy and crazy, you know, uh, is why you would need somebody to help you, and what kind of help you expect to get, mm. you know. Like, I mean, music is a crazy endeavor in the sense that, you know, it's like a pyramid, but there's not a lot of room at the top. Like, if you're a computer engineer, you really don't have to be the best computer engineer in the world to make a living, right? Mm -hmm. You could just be okay, and you're going to get a fine job. And even if you want to be, like, a millionaire, you can just be, like, okay plus and be a millionaire. Yeah. You know? But uh, imagine a world where you had to be you know, in a field where millions of people do it and you have to be one, one of 10 that makes a living, mm -hmm. you know? So it's a crazy endeavor in the sense that, you know, it's very unlikely statistically that you're going to be the guy that manages to, to earn enough money to live doing this, especially if you're doing something fringy. Mm -hmm. So it's a real balance between uh, believing in yourself, taking a large chance and... Uh, you know, it's more like a, you know, the, the business model is more like a race. Only mm. the guy that's coming in like first, second and third gets to right. <laughs> go home with something. Uh, one thing you mentioned, which I sort of sort of liked is um, you just you said, if, especially if you're doing something fringy. Now, I wouldn't exactly call Marvin fringy. I mean, you guys are definitely quirky. Um, you you have a immediately catchy and, and fun sound. I think part of that is probably attributed to uh Danny's tiny saxophone. Ah, uh, we play fusion, man. No, that's that's <laughs> true. But uh, I, so I just no, I'm saying it's not it's not fringy at all. So um, for you guys, I don't know if it's not fringy. It's very fringy compared to Rihanna or Justin Bieber true. or you true. know even like those you know bands that shall not be named uh, <laughs> that are you know that are mixing kind of very popular types like sounds borrowed from like hip hop or something it's mm -hmm. much more relevant to today you know it's much more of a natural crossover right uh into jazz you know well uh than, than us right well you are on a jazz podcast so maybe in 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 a relative scope compared to jazz we're definitely not fringy but i, I would say that i was just talking about music in general right so i did want to sort of pick your brain about like you two and danny seemed so simpatico did you did you have this idea to be a a jazz rock shredding band when you two first got together all the players we both grew up on mm. were the kind of players uh in hebrew there's an expression called la vie baroche and um i think it's it's like means like to kill it i guess in hebrew mm -hmm. but it actually means to like pound the head <laughs> Like, that's the literal and, uh, translation the literal translation yeah and uh, we both I remember like since early on we were using the same terminology about like a successful solo hmm. and you know there's kind of like a dizzying effect like almost like drug induced hmm. that you get from listening to, the, to what I would consider the great solos you know it's just like somebody bulldozing your mind 
you know, and um, and there was just nothing not violent about the kind of express where you know, whereas some people would would uh, have the vision of a uh, great solo being like somebody making love to their ear. We wanted to f*** their brains out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it was a childish fantasy about like how... Because everybody, everybody's in charge of defining their own success in art, yeah. right? That's a part of what, who you are as a player. So... You know, but we would have these experiences of listening to music from early childhood and just listening to the kind of people like, I don't know, Michael Brecker. Mm. Or for me, it was like Stevie Ray Vaughan or mm. Scott Henderson or Alan Holdsworth to where it, it was just like these people breaking your brain into pieces. And that's the kind of players that we always wanted to be. We didn't want to be like, a, I guess, a minimalist mm. We didn't have a minimalist approach to soloing or something like that, to where we were just trying to be like the most subtle and the most beautiful. It was more more athletic. Mm -hmm. Like being the best was like a, a big part of the terminology that we used to, you know, that we would use. Yeah. So there was definitely some. I I don't think that's a big secret. At least listening to our music, if that's what we're. Doing. <laughs> I, it subtlety is a. Uh, I can respect lack of subtlety. That's a. Uh, that's how I roll. There is well. no. Again, you know, I don't think the, our music is not does not ooze subtlety. No. Um, <laughs> so uh, I want to talk about your uh, last recording. So uh, is th this is your sixth or seventh? The one we just mm -hmm. made? It will be. Our so can you, uh, how has, uh, you, you mentioned especially some of the earlier stuff is a bit more modal. So how has uh, both uh, the sound of Marvin and the process of Marvin changed from then to now? Uh, I think, um, okay, the first three records we made were essentially, like, before we started touring. Mm. I, well, the last chapter, I guess the first two, definitely, before we started touring. And the third one was kind of, we were making it as we were starting out. And they were more exercises of the imagination. Mm. It, like, they didn't have... Um, they didn't have this thing, ab this thing about them about capturing a sound. It was more producing a sound, engineering moments, you know. So we would. It was kind of an internal studio adventure for us, where we'd see what's in our imagination, use all these instruments, you know, take kind of wild chances. And I think we we came up with like very, you know, some of some of those that music. I think is. I think all of it's great, but you know, I think some of it's really interesting, and some of the stuff hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. But there is kind of a pixie magic, weird vibe to mm -hmm. it at points, uh, which you know, because we're just messing with sounds in the studio. Uh, our fourth, fifth, and sixth album, uh, third set, aggressive hippies and goat men. Mm -hmm. We're already at a point where we were touring 300 days a year. Mm. You know, third set being a live CD, each song recorded in different, like, shitty dive bar because we were unknown at that point. Uh, and, uh, you know, Aggressive Hippies and Goatman, were so, it was already a change in approach mm. in the sense that me and Danny would get together, write an hour of music, and, and then go tour with it for about a year, mm. and then make a record, and we'd go to the studio and just know how to play these songs, mm -hmm. and just go in and play them. And this is how we made our latest record, our seventh one, which is going to be called Israeli Jazz. Mm. Um, so, you know, we, we were making things with that approach, and that's different, because that's more like the way Louis Armstrong would make a record than the way maybe you know, a pop band or a rock band makes a record, which is like, go to the studio and imagine mm -hmm. it, or go and capture something that, uh, you know, is already tried. And it's a tricky process, too, because in a sense, you know, if you go out and play music with a lot of room for improvisation, you know, a jazz-based music every night, then, you know, really about, I would say a good 70% of it is very flexible and fluid. Mm -hmm. And to capture a version of it that you're ready to commit to is something that takes a lot of work. Yeah. And so I want, I, kind of going off of this whole studio thing, I think, uh, you guys use social media really well. And two of the things you do Thank is you. One, one thing we uh, talked about was the gypsy shredding. You often post little gypsy tutorials, like how to play something like Django or here's how to play this 
super chromatic gypsy shred. Yeah, that's crazy to me. I'm, I'm actually getting more known as a gypsy player, which I have never done once professionally. <laughs> <laughs> and a fusion musician that's been my right, career. But, so speaking yeah. of fusion, that's actually how I found out about you guys. I, I saw one of your videos floating around Facebook and I saw it and I, and I liked your page and page. And I mean, how do you as a band and you personally use social media to uh, not to get your stuff out there in in a not so vapid, but really a warm and open way because, and I think this has something to do with the fact that you guys have this super do it yourself approach. It's quirky. You embrace the quirkiness. You embrace the shred are you thinking about all that when you post something or or is this just hey this is what we're doing Chuck? um all right well in the band my role is more like the queen of england in the sense that i'm a symbolic figure and other danny really runs the business side of it um which not a lot of people know so but he does a hundred percent of the wow. booking and um and he runs the the social media mm. well he runs, he runs, you know, the, the marketing end of it. And he will consult me uh, and we'll talk about things. But uh, we both know that he's consulting me out of manners. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, but we, do, we do talk things through. Um, but I will say that, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty good at, uh, I think, making spontaneous content mm. when it comes to like guitar stuff. And I mean, again, you know, we we went a lot of years building you know it's not true that like you know the five years or four and a half years we were on the road before those videos hit mm -hmm. facebook what really happened was we were touring all over and we were cultivating a small but very loyal fan mm -hmm. base and i think it was about fifteen thousand people mm -hmm. strong so meaning we would make a few thousand you know a thousand or two thousand three thousand fans mm -hmm. a year for a few years mm -hmm. you know um just by playing in dive bars and having some word word, word of mouth kind of thing spread and by the time in 2015 when we released our two first two videos red line and african shop tie um you know then i think the initial push that uh, our actual fans gave it outwardly made made those things go mm. viral, um, and that was really the thing that started putting us on the map and started uh, amounting to to something. You know, all of a sudden we know we noticed immediately. Mm -hmm. You know that like it was spreading at a rate that was completely unprecedented for us. So that that was really the beginning the beginning of the whole social media thing for us after that you know uh it was just a matter of of gener generating content being mm -hmm. generous about knowledge mm -hmm. i think is uh if you have some and people are listening to you i never saw a reason why not to give it away for mm -hmm. free you know whereas a lot of uh, musicians really try to capitalize mm -hmm. on you know like every bit of information that they have i never felt the need to do that because for me I felt like I wanted to play guitar and make songs, make make recordings and play songs for people for a living, not sell them little tips. Um, so for me, if somebody liked um, liked Marvin and liked my lessons, I assumed that the way that they will reward me for that is by coming to the show and maybe buying mm -hmm. an album. Um, and that seems to be like the big win-win so i never mind you know being generous with the you know bits of information that i have about you know gypsy jazz or posting a little thing here or spending an hour in a cafe doing a live yeah. feed i think another thing that caught a lot of people was as soon as that facebook mm. live feature popped up we immediately like was like oh what's this pressed it and then we were like live <laughs> and i i didn't realize but i think we we're one of the bands that really kind of was pioneering that in a uh, consistent way well, not not only in five years will you have made the word shred totally ubiquitous again, but it is on record <laughs> oh my God. that Marbin did in fact pioneer Facebook Live. <laughs> Danny, you could you could not have given me a better transition to the final question I have for you. And uh, this this okay. podcast is 
all about uh, original music and original art. And uh, do you have any advice for those looking to create original art? Well, yeah, I have tons of advice. Um, First of all, I think, um, you know, when you're talking about originality as a concept, Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a good place to put the emphasis because, you know, it's um, when you're talking about things that haven't been done, First of all, you got to assume as, a, as an intelligent person that you don't have the awareness of the things that have mm. been done. So if that's your first attempt, innovation, before any sort of respect for mm. tradition, then you're just, you know, it's like saying I want to make the best car, the, the most innovative car, but from scratch. Right. <laughs> and, I've never, and I never w- saw a car right. before. So you can spend your entire life just trying to make some sort of design for Mm. the wheel. You know what I mean? (laughs) And reinvent that. And you really shouldn't do that. You know, it's uh, like you got to it's like uh, the the Einstein quote of standing on the shoulders Mm. of giants. You know, Uh, you really got to do that. You got to if you take your time to study technique, harmony, rhythm and and the great players then through mastering a style, that should be the focus of mm. a student, through mastering your own stuff, through mastering, you know, through, through imitation too, you know, you get to a place eventually where you understand what's been done and you've developed yourself to an extent that everything you do mm. is new because you're, at, you're, at the, you're past the border of what's been done through practice and through study. Uh, and then every choice you make is unique. So, uh, and I think that's the point, especially in jazz, where it's not compositional music. You need to actually make original mm. choices. You know, so you have to somehow, you know, become like mm. virtuous. You know, that's what vir- virtuosity, mm-hmm. you know, is 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 a derivative of the word virtue. And and in a sense, you know, that's like uh, that's like the if you, if you know anything about like uh, Socrates and like the way he, he saw mm-hmm. philosophy to become virtuous is not something you can easily mm. study you have to kind of develop virtue and virtue is not uh, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to develop it takes a lot of time and it's about being able to make choices in a dynamic reality that keeps changing so you can't study the choice because the choice depends on the situation so meaning like you know there's a thousand tunes to play and there's a, a lot of ways of doing things and somehow you need to be a good mm. choice maker. So in, in, to become, you know, and, and it's very clear when you look at a guy like Louis Armstrong or a guy like uh, Charlie Parker or a guy like, you know, anybody, mm-hmm. Pat Metheny, they're all very different people that would make very different choices, but they'd make very personal choices that are all great and sound like mm-hmm. themselves. So you just got to become this mm-hmm. personality on an instrument and there's nothing simple about doing that but practicing and studying seems to be kind of the way yeah. in there so i think committing to a path like that is a very well danny thank you so much for time man we really appreciate it yeah you're welcome so uh before to end your segment uh we're gonna play uh, a track of marbins is there anything you want us to play play whiskey chaser okay we can do that thanks for your time man <coughs>
want to learn more about Marbin or purchase their music, please go to marbinmusic.com. Next up is Mike Catone, who originally hails from Rochester, New York, and he's the trumpet player and co-leader of the California contemporary jazz band Holophoner. The band formed in the Thelonious Monk Institute in 2012 after Catone moved to California from the Eastman School of Music. They create picturesque and engaging music. They are Mike on trumpet, Josh Johnson on alto, Eric Miller on trombone, Diego Urbano on vibes, Miro Sprague on piano, and Jonathan Pinson on drums. Holophoner self released a self-titled album in 2014 and signed on with Alpha Pup for their upcoming release, Light Magnet. We talked with Mike about his trumpet education, what he learned touring with Blood, Sweat, and Tears and some other fun bands, and the compositional process of Holophone. Mike, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Good to be here. So uh, let's kind of start from the beginning. Um, you are actually from my hometown. We share a hometown, Rochester, New York. So uh, how did you get hooked on trumpet and on jazz. Hmm. Well, uh, music was always good records of being played, played at home. Uh, Motown records, a little bit of jazz here and there. Uh, my grandmother's uh, boyfriend at the time had um, a number of cassette tapes that he gave me. So, uh, you know, Glenn Miller, Louis Armstrong, all sorts of good music I was exposed to from an early age. Uh, played piano a little bit, um, had a little toy Casio. Tried to figure out commercials. Mom and dad realized music was definitely something that was in my blood. Uh, I'm also adopted and no one in my family was. Anyway, so I started playing music uh, with just a little keyboard and then picked up a trumpet when I was about five and nothing came out. Mm -hmm. Didn't touch it until five years later in band. Wanted to play saxophone and they said, uh, you know, you don't have the embouchure for saxophone, which basically meant Mm -hmm. we have too many sax players. Um, we, mm. need, we need brass. So they tried to get me to play French horn. I said, heck no. Um, picked up a trumpet because I wanted to be in jazz band. So yeah. I've been playing since I was about 10. And, uh, you know, I got into jazz band pretty quick. Um, quickly moved up through the ranks in high school and middle school to lead trumpet. And then uh, shortly after that, I got to high school and studied with Daniel Murray. And mm. that's when things really uh, kicked off for me. Um, he started giving me all the right records from the beginning, um, all the right trumpet stuff to start practicing, to build a, you know, my chops up, start doing all county, all state. And uh, my junior year, I mean, I wanted to be an Air Force pilot or engineer, one of those things that I did not hmm. ever see myself earning a living as a musician. And he said, I think you've got a shot at it. And he said, if you do it now, worst case, you can go back and get on the path that you were on to be an engineer. But if you mm-hmm. do this now, then you won't have that, you know, regret anymore hmm. so i took his advice end of my junior year and just went full throttle into music started shedding all the time um got took a couple summer camps over at eastman got to work with jeff campbell mm-hmm. bob snyder rich thompson and then um probably sometime during my my senior year it was christmas time actually dan passed away in a heart attack in his sleep uh, mm-hmm. and so that was definitely a, a big kick to not look back so I took yeah. his advice and tried to become a musician. And we're going to get a little background music here because we're at an amphitheater and I can't find a quiet room anywhere. So it's kind of funny. Oh, no, you can't play saxophone. You get to cool the, you get to play the other cool kid instrument trumpet. <laughs> and I just, as a trombone player and bassist, I, I kind of laugh at that. It's like, oh, man, I, I can't play sax, but I get to play trumpet. So I can't help but <laughs> poking fun at you a little well, bit. Well, I remember, I remember the, the woman... <sighs> Her name is, is escaping me. My fifth grade band director. She was such a sweetheart. Um, mm. But but I remember her saying, "Oh, you've, you've got a French horn, I'm sure." And I was like, "I may only be ten years old, but I can see right through you on this one. I know you just need brass players." Um, <laughs> and I said, "You know, the French horn is cool. I'm not trying to knock French yep. horn, but yeah. I know that there isn't French horn in jazz band unless you're playing a Bob City with Miles Davis." So you mentioned you uh, went to Eastman summer camps. Um, can you tell us what your time was like in Eastman? And, you know, at that point you had the emotional experience of your teacher passing away and you, you knew you really wanted to pursue music. So how did, how did Eastman uh, and that really academic environment serve you to, to pursue music and how did it sharpen your skills as a trumpet player? Well, initially, I mean, I had a pretty good set of chops going into college and 
I had transcribed solos and learned solos by ear or written solos. So I had some vocabulary that allowed me to just get through songs uh, based mm -hmm. on what I was hearing. My um, harmonic knowledge was pretty shallow. So the summer camp scared the crap out of me in that I was playing with all these kids who had been transcribing, learning harmony and whatnot since they were 10 years old, where I got a bit of a late start. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got to Eastman, the traditional theory, you know, uh, Dr. Marvin and whatnot, everything was really cool for me. It started backfilling, mm -hmm. and my, my ears started to catch up to my uh, abilities. Man, this music is killing in the background. <laughs> my, my, ears, my ears started to catch up with my, um, or my harmony started to catch up with my ears. Yeah. And then, technically, I got to study with this amazing professor, Doug Prosser. Mm. And, and he really didn't speak my first year much. We just sat mm. there next to each other and played trumpet. And that was one of the best ways of learning I've ever encountered. And when I have students that try to talk to me too much or get too wordy about things, I'm just like, man, just pick up your horn. I'm going to play, and then you play. I'm going to play, and you're going to play. And, and that no BS approach to just getting things done can be, I guess, interpreted as, as mean or grumpy, but man, is it ever effective. So uh, East, Eastman was a swift kick in the tail for me to just kind of try to catch up. And I, also, there was another guy there I forgot to mention. His name was Denver Dill. Hmm. Now, Denver is, is a, a wizard at the trumpet, and uh, I had some basic problems, and the stuff he gave me in those couple lessons hanging out, uh, I still use to this day to just try to recover from a show or... Mm -hmm. you know get ready for something important and one thing we uh briefly discussed before uh we went live here is you actually derive a lot of your sound concept from a kind of a classical perspective uh working with doug can you expand upon that a little bit yeah, um what like doug presser won't, won't do it a lot but when he plays b flat trumpet he's got this old Bach strat mm. and, and his sound is just the best way i can describe it is butter i mean it mm. is smooth as butter the attacks are so clear, so pristine, and he's not necessarily working too hard. It's a, it's an efficiency in, in the sound, and I think when I hear a trumpet player is working too hard or forcing things, that's not necessarily the sound I want to make. Um, mm -hmm. I like I like a buttery, smooth sound, something that's kind of connected. Um, a couple of trumpet players I know that play that way now, uh, Sean Jones, Mike Rodriguez in New York, they just have such a flowing element to their sound, and look at when Marcellus, one of the greatest trumpet players of all time mm -hmm. is a master of classical trumpet and of course improvisation and in order to survive as a, a brass player and work in as many different situations as possible you've got to have a good set of classical chops mm -hmm. and um you know sitting there listening to Doug play day after day was so amazing and then to go sit in the room with Clay from the store Clay Jenkins get all my harmony caught up and hear his sound concept <clears throat> it was just I don't know, it was an amazing experience. I feel extremely, you know, blessed and, and lucky that I was able to study with two amazing teachers for four and a half years. And the luck with teachers extended into luck into other things. Reading through uh, your website and your bio, I think you play with some of, like, the dream list of what rock jazz trumpeters want to do, just to name a couple it's blood, sweat, and tears, and Don and Don Henley of the Eagles. I mean, how? What did you learn being on the road with groups like that and playing something that just feels so good all the time? But what did you learn from your time on the road with guys like that? Well, well, the funny thing is uh, that blood, sweat, and tears horn section. Since I, I left blood, sweat, and tears to join Bette Midler, mm -hmm. um, it was kind of an opportunity I couldn't turn down. Um, and I definitely had feelings of regret about doing that. But um, this playing that show, it was, it was very different, but it was like a school in itself. Hmm. That whole horn section ended up leaving Blood, Sweat, and Tears shortly after I left. Hmm. And is the horn section for Don Henley. And we just did City Field a few days ago with hmm. the Eagles. And a week and a half before that, or a week before that, we played uh, Dodger Stadium with the Eagles as well. So I've now got two shows with the Eagles under my belt. Um, which was, you know, I, I freakish. I, I have no idea how I was there or why. But um, in terms of the rock trumpet playing, you know, Blood, Sweat, and Tears was a whole whole different level of experience. I mean, the people come to see you play horn. You're mm -hmm. not behind a singer necessarily that they're obsessed about. Mm -hmm. They're there to see the horn section. 
and um, I think we spend so much of our careers shedding in the practice room and mm. just making other people sound good, unless of course you're in a jazz setting where it's your gig. When you're in the pop realm or the rock realm, you're usually just backing someone up like we do with the Eagles. Mm -hmm. So to have that moment in the spotlight with Blood, Sweat, and Tears was priceless. I mean, you, you've got to you've got to hit and if you're having a bad day you still got to hit so that's when I'm sitting there digging through my my lessons with Doug Prosser, my lessons with Clay Jenkins, my lessons with Denver Dill and Dan McMurray my high school teacher just trying to recover because you have no choice you've got to be on the horn every day yeah and, and speaking of continuing learning experiences so the reason we're interviewing today is not just because you're a good hang of course you are but you're you're in this super awesome group called Holophoner, and you guys met uh, in 2012 when you were all auditioning for the Thelonious Monk Institute. So for those, I'm sure most listening to this podcast know how the Thelonious Monk system works, so I, we, we don't have to go through that whole thing, but when you guys were first sort of locked in that room together, was there this instant chemistry between you guys or did you have to just grind it out until something happened oh that's that's a great question um I, I guess the best way i can describe it is when we first met we were in a group of 36 people hmm. um in, in a room over at ucla waiting to play for herbie hancock wayne shorter jimmy heath kenny burrell james <laughs> newton and tom carter the head of the muck institute oh. um and uh, I, I guess, I mean, we're, first of all, we're all super nervous. Right. But we had been preparing this list of songs for about a month before that. So everyone knew the material, mm -hmm. but we didn't necessarily know each other. Mm. So somehow we were cut and pasted between the 36 of us into the room and asked to play. So, so the best way I can describe the, the energy was, was a bit of panic, mm. um, frantic. You don't really realize what you're doing you're, it's more of an out of body experience you're kind of watching yourself play mm. because you've over prepared for this and you're with a whole bunch of people that are just as nervous that are right. just as prepared but also great musicians mm. so when they put the right combination of players together um, you could instantly see the reaction on Herbie Hancock Wayne Shorter and Jimmy East's face oh. that they were hearing something they liked Yeah. and Jimmy he stood up and he took a picture of us, and he goes, my name is Steven Steelsberg, you know, because Jimmy's got all these silly, silly one-liners. Yeah. You got to go to the bathroom, you say, uh, I got to go see Henry Pissinger, you know, like, it's, it's just, <laughs> I don't know if this is podcast appropriate, but, but I mean, it's just so funny to work with him, and so we had an absolute blast that mm -hmm. first day. We were running on adrenaline, and then when we finally got to work together and play initially, it was... It was definitely an instant chemistry and blend of sounds, colors, and energy. There was never, um, I guess, the harder parts come now when we get together and we want to play. And for the first few days when we get back together, mm -hmm. it's an explosion of energy and it's amazing. Yeah. The challenge is when we do two, three, four shows in a row, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily want to repeat what we played the day before. So then the right. challenge becomes, how do you... How do you keep having it feel like the first time? And, and it, the blessing with us is that we all are so busy with so many other projects mm -hmm. and when we get back together, it's an explosion of energy and it's awesome. Yeah. So the hard part is keeping that going all the time. Right. I'm really glad you said something about that. So this is a jazz podcast, so it's a little, it's a little niche anyway, but we're going to get two super niche references. There's this uh, contemporary classical uh, a cappella group called the King Singers, and they did this huge concert with the BB, BBC Proms. I think almost ten years ago or something. And the interviewer asked him, "You, you know, the King Singers have been around together. This lineup has been around for years. How do you guys manage it?" And one of them looks at the rest of them and says, "Well, we just came back from a two-week holiday, so that's how we do it." <laughs> so that just it, yeah, it's like you gotta get away. You gotta, and you know, absence makes the the heart grow fonder and brings you some more energy so th the next little niche reference i have here so maybe some people listening are, are a little confused by the name holophoner so holophoner is actually it's a recorder like instrument in the uh, sci-fi comedy cartoon futurama where you sort of play it and it uh, projects a picture of uh what you're playing and i know one of the goals of holophoner is to try to sort of 
paint a picture musically. But w- when you guys were first getting together, was that the goal when you first got together and you said, oh, this is a funny name. Let's try to paint pictures with music or how did sort of the group aesthetic and then the name come about? Well, it's kind of funny. So, so Diego Urbano, our vibes player, he's, he's a very unique character. He's hilarious. He's from Chile, Mm -hmm. unbelievably talented. Um, definitely, uh, him and we, we spent countless hours talking about cars and you know, I'm, I'm the car geek of the group, mm-hmm. and Diego is also very much into cars. No one else could really care about a car um, in the band. Um, and so Diego and I are definitely a bit clowny. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're, we're the goofy ones. And and Diego and I just, like, love to hang out. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wrote this song called Instructions on How to Play the Holophoner. And we all didn't know what it was. We had all seen Futurama but never placed it. Right. And so... When uh, we got through our second year of, uh, of the Institute, mm. we had just recorded that song. Mm. And when we were trying to find an album title, you know, it was like we could come up with space names because we hang out with, with uh, you know, Mr. Wayne Shorter. Mm-hmm. We can come up with something plain or jazzy sounding. But I, I think um, a, a bunch of us in the group liked just the word holophoner mm. and, and the, the concept of what that instrument is because... You know, when, when you're writing a song, it's usually inspired by something. If you're writing a song in an academic sense, it sounds academic. If you're writing a song that was actually inspired by real events in your life, you know, many times it comes out in music and the audience can, can experience that. Mm-hmm. So holophoner meaning a recorder-like instrument that projects a hologram mm. of an image. And the better you are at an instrument, the more elaborate the picture is. Right. I feel like musically and you know inspirationally it, it, it speaks very specifically to what the goal of our band is we want our audience to come see a show not be bored and not think of our music as too academic but think of it as painting a picture or telling a story or showing a, a, a movie or a film if you will yeah um so that that name just absolutely fit perfectly um we even had an argument about changing the name after um, our first album came out but i just think that the, the the power in that name is just too great to, to waste. Yeah, and one thing you sort of mentioned is, I think when you write stuff academically, it's very abstract, but when you write things picturesque in a picture-like way, or it's based on experience, it comes out a little bit more concrete. So that, that sort of leads into my next question. What's the compositional process like in that whole group? Do you have a couple guys who do most of the composing? Is it all very um is it all kind of by committee do you all work together how, how do you guys compose stuff and how do you decide what goes on a set list or your first album or your upcoming album it's it's um it couldn't be any more diverse mm. between all of us so you've got eric miller who during the super bowl a couple of years ago wrote an entire composition sitting on the floor at my friend brett ashy's house wow um he, I mean, he pretty much wrote the entire core of the tune and started arranging it sitting there on the floor. Um, well, most of us were sitting there having a beer watching the right. football. He just <laughs> wrote, wrote a song. So that's one concept. Uh, the second concept is, I guess, my, my route, which takes me a little bit of time. Mm. It takes me forever to write eight bars. Um, and then you've got Josh Johnson, who's an, a brilliant composer and tends to Right, I guess he's, he writes more than uh, most of his compositions are, are definitely, they make the, the cut to our albums mm. because they apply to everyone's strengths in the band. Um, Dave Robert writes a little bit slower like myself. Um, Murrow Sprague generally writes the tunes that challenge the heck out mm. of us. Um, I love Jonathan Pinson, the drummer. He has some really, really fun compositions. Uh, let's see, Diego tends to write really abstract things. Mm-hmm. Um, or he just is such a, a beautifully creative person. Mm. I really like to see what he comes to the table with. Um, so we have all these like different, completely seven complete different stories when it comes to composition. But the one thing that we were challenged to do is write a tune together. Mm. And uh, try, you know, Dick, Dick Oates pushed us to do this. Mm-hmm. Billy Childs pushed mm-hmm. us to do this. And. Um, we have a few tunes in our catalog that we wrote collectively that have been kind of the most fun experiences for all of us. Mm-hmm. Um, as a tune, uh, Source of the Forest on our first album, and then uh, 
totally spacing on another track name. But we've we've probably got two on the first album that were collectively written, and um, two more on this upcoming album that are are collectively. Cool. So that's a great transition. So your first album, self-named Holophoner, uh, that was self-released, and now this upcoming one, uh, Light Magnet, will will keep our listeners appraised on the uh, on the final release date. Um, but that's you guys have signed to Alpha Pup Records, so this record is coming out through them. So you sort of mentioned that each each one of these have some some pieces that are more collectively uh, collectively composed. But what's changed with Holophoner in terms of sound and in process from album one to this new album? Well, the, the first album we did, we, we tried to do it as live as mm-hmm. possible. We were, we were in one big room uh, up in Pasadena. Mm-hmm. And the, the next album we did, we, we recorded at Henson Studios a little more isolation mm-hmm. um, and flexibility to go and edit things later. Um, a little bit more post-production room. Um, but the, the biggest difference is Wayne Shorter produced this album mm-hmm. and was in the recording booth while we were recording the second mm-hmm. album. And if that doesn't motivate you to do something, I don't know what does. <laughs> so it's been really cool. To, it was, it was, you know, it was a priceless, amazing experience just from like going to Mr. Shorter's house and picking him up and driving him to the mm-hmm. recording studio and just having him hang out and tell stories while we're mm-hmm. there. I mean, the music we played, we all knew pretty well because we had rehearsed so mm-hmm. much. And there is a crazy, crazy downpour happening outside right now. <laughs> In Florida, the sun's out, and then all of a sudden, it is a monsoon. <laughs> Sounds like um, Rochester. And by the way, the music the music you're listening to in the background is Straight No Chaser and Acapella Group. Yeah. Um, so I hope it's not too loud when you get to the raw audio here. Um, but uh, I guess the, what's different? I mean, that's the thing is, it's not really that much different. It's just we're all that much more busy. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we got together and were able to record in the same city is, is pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. I guess it's almost, our, our band is almost like the a collective now in that, Everybody lives in a different city, but we get together to mm-hmm. to record and, and tour. Um, but the compositions, the funny thing is that there were a lot of compositions that didn't make our first record because we had too much music over the course mm-hmm. of two years. Um, so there's some leftovers mm-hmm. that didn't make the first cut that have now been placed on this album and a few fresh new things that some of the cats have written since Very then. Very cool. Well, But I think everybody's represented on the new album. I think everyone. Oh, that's just great to hear. So I've I have one more question for you. This is something. After all, this is a podcast about original music. So, do you have any advice for those who are looking to create original art? Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great question. Uh, my advice is if you can write a little bit every mm. day and not become too emotionally attached to what it is that you start writing, mm-hmm. you won't get as hung up. Um, a little bit every day goes a long way because then you have this massive pool of compositions and ideas to, to pull from. And one thing I do is I tend to make a lot of voice memos on my mm-hmm. phone whenever I get slightly inspired. <laughs> Woo! The door just blew yeah. open. <laughs> and some serious wind. Serious wind, <laughs> yeah. serious wind. Yeah, serious win. So, you know, I can, if you want to write original music, I mean, just, just find something to be inspired by. And um, if you have a story behind what it is that you're mm. playing, it will uh, it will inspire somebody else. I mean, try to not be, you know, you practice writing in an academic mm-hmm. setting to, to build your chops. But ultimately, when you want to connect with an audience, you have to have a story with what it is that you're doing. Yep. Um, and also, I mean, you can't jam it down people's throats. Mm-hmm. I think um, it's kind of easy to tell when you're watching a, a musician play and they're they're playing to impress mm-hmm. you. And then you can tell when they're playing for themselves and what they believe in. Thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. We're going to end your little segment with uh, a track from Holophoner. Is there anything you'd uh, like us to play to end this segment from your first album? Well, from the first album, I since it's an interview with me, um, I guess we could play the tune The Traveler. Uh, Herbie Hancock said, I want you guys to write a piece of music about a certain place mm. in the world. And I had been, I had been checking out this. It was so funny. It's a Yanni concert on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And um, the instrument that they're playing is a Duke, And I've been working 
you know, in LA, I, I played a couple of Persian weddings mm. and a couple, um, I played with an artist named mm. Ebi and, <clears throat> and another guy, um, Guy Monakian, <clears throat> excuse me. And one of the uh, instruments that the, the clarinetists double in is called mm. the Kidu. It's this big double reed instrument. And, um, I heard this gorgeous melody. Sorry, brain one more time. <laughs> I heard this gorgeous melody. And so I, uh, I just kind of tried to build an entire composition around that melody. Very cool. All right, Mike, thank you so much for your time. You can check out more information about Holophoner on their website. Thanks for your time, brother. Appreciate it.
you'd like to know more about Mike Catone, go to MikeCatone.com. Or if you want to learn more about Holophoner or to purchase their music, go to HolophonerMusic.com. <laughs> Dave Chisholm is a trumpet player, jazz composer, guitarist, singer-songwriter, and a comic book artist, boasting a resume that includes many albums from his rock days in Salt Lake City, providing the trumpet for the NBA theme, and working with Joseph Gordon-Levitt's hit Record Projects, Dave just released in April a new comic book called Instrumental through Z2 Comics and a corresponding soundtrack right here on Outside End Music, which he composed and played trumpet on. Instrumental is about an unhappy jazz trumpet player named Tom, who is given a magical trumpet and it develops from there. Dave is a graduate of University of Utah in the Eastman School of Music, and he now lives in Rochester, New York, where most Rochesterians know him as the frontman for the rock group Talking Underwater. We talked with Dave about the process of creating this comic, comic and jazz's social context, and the outpouring of positive reception that Instrumental has received. Dave, thanks for joining us today, man. Thanks for having me, Dan. And uh, I can't help but notice that we have a we have a special guest as well. Yeah, this is Tilly. <laughs> she just decided to get on my lap because she wants to be on TV. Well, I, with a face like that, she is she looks better on camera than I do. So we're we're, <laughs> we're glad she's here to to pretty up the shoot. So before we get uh, too far into this here, I want to be the first to officially and congratulate you on your engagement at the time we're filming it's oh. it's just about a week from from the big moment i happen to be there it was very sweet thanks man thanks yeah it was amazing it, it it was and i know engaged life is treating you very well so uh yeah you we kind of have a nice opportunity to talk about two things namely uh both the comic books and jazz so we'll kind of take a dual approach here so uh, when, when did you first become interested in both jazz and comics? Oh gosh. Uh, I, I got, I, I've been into comics my whole life. Mm. Uh, to this day, my mom claims that my first word was Spider-Man. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it's been like an obsession my whole life. And I've always been, uh, really, uh, like obsessed with drawing and um making visual art and everything uh jazz music is is a little bit different i think um although my i remember hearing is my dad listening to like sketches of spain Mm -hmm. and let my children hear music by charles mingus uh like a lot of miles and a lot of mingus but um i would be like totally lying if i said that i was really into it back then when i was like four years old Mm. it was just something that like kind of filled the air and had a mystery about it Mm -hmm. um i i really got into jazz music heavily when i was in was i when i was in high school Mm -hmm. like probably a lot of people do uh and i really my path into jazz was really unusual in that like uh, i really was into like music that was a little bit more free um, like 1970s Miles Davis music, which is quite avant-garde. And then a lot of like the more adventurous Charles Mingus music, like in particular the Charles Mingus records with uh, Eric Dolphy on mm-hmm. saxophone and bass clarinet and flute. And I really loved the immediacy and the like heart on heart on the sleeve, emotional content of that music. Um, and... I think that maybe that's a little bit unique in the realm of like, I think a lot of kids get into, uh, younger people get into jazz music for different, different reasons. And that Mm -hmm. was stuff that I really dug like right off the bat. Um, and then I kind of found my way back into the more traditional standard fare. Uh, and I love that stuff as well at this point. So, yeah. And so we, we've had the, we've known each other for a while and we've had the opportunity to discuss a couple times and, uh, what I'm sort of remembering here is that you you had this interest for comics really early on, and then jazz happened, and you focused on that for a really long time, and then you kind of came back into comics. Is that right? Yeah, I mean it's it's almost like a little bit of like a three prong thing, right? So like one prong is comics, one prong is um, jazz music, and one prong is like rock music or mm-hmm. rock and pop. And um, I love all these, all three of these things. 
and at various points they compete with each other for like my uh ob- current obsession mm. um so like when i was in high school i was like obsessed with making comics and i wanted to like be like the great the next great like comic artist and everything and then like around my junior year i became obsessed with jazz music and then i went through my undergrad and it took me five years to get my degree Mm -hmm. and when i finished i was kind of burned out on jazz music and had really fallen in love with like rock music so i joined rock bands and started rock bands and wrote a lot of that music and then i took four years off before going back to getting back into took four years off and in that span of time uh i got then like kind of fell out with that style of music and got back into drawing comics. And I Mm. made this series called let's go to Utah. Mm -hmm. Um, And then while I was working on let's go to Utah, I went back to school to get my master's degree. And then I finished let's go to Utah in the middle of that. And then I moved to Rochester to get my doctorate. And while I was working on my doctorate, I had this idea for a comic series that eventually became instrumental. And I started working on that right after I finished my degree uh, in 2013. Mm. And then after I, after I more or less finished the bulk of the work on instrumental, which was a pretty big project, I, um, kind of fell back in with like rock and pop music. And, uh, that's where my band talking underwater comes in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, all of these various like obsessions of mine sort of all compete for, uh, for my time. Yeah. You know, now along with the, uh, obviously like being an adult and trying to do all the mm. responsible things <laughs> competes with like stuff like teaching, yeah. uh, which I also really love mm-hmm. and, you know, trying to like make time for friends and loved ones and, mm. and engagements and right. all that stuff. It's funny. So, it's funny. You mentioned, uh, the process of, uh, doing instrumental, uh, you, cause you were working on this about the same time that you had your doctorate and you, you kind of fell into this work spiral of instrumental, didn't you? You just got totally sucked in and immersed for the amount of time you had to do it. I mean, this was a whirlwind. I mean, you finished, well, it's like, it's like 200, 224 pages in a really short amount of time, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I um, I had a really r- rigorous study routine mm-hmm. from uh, from being, um, from working on my doctorate. I had this really rigorous study routine because uh, of the big test at the end of a doc at the end of the doctorate and it's the day after i finished the test i like started work on instrumental uh started like the work proper like scripting and mm-hmm. laying out pages and kind of all that stuff and that was like february 7th i think of 2013 mm-hmm. and i worked like probably i mean it sounds dumb to like someone who actually works like a 40 hour a week job Right. Like I feel very privileged in that like my life I've I'm lucky to be good enough at the stuff that I love that like I can kind of live like the artist bohemian mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. But there's something about like putting in like about 40 hours a week on drawing a comic, recording an album, or mm-hmm. writing an album, recording it, mixing it, you know, and all the aspects of comic book making like writing a script, plotting it out, writing a script. Uh doing pencils, doing inks, scanning it, cleaning up the pages, doing lettering, and then doing any sort of like edits and redraws and change, like editing the script and editing like what I've already completed. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I finished the whole thing, 224 pages plus an album of music in, um, in, uh, like over the course of about 10 and a half months. Jeez. So, a lot of it was definitely a fevered time. I don't know how I did it. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I if I tried. So, uh, so this cat, I, it's pretty cute. I mean, it's I'm glad it's happening. It it's really adorable. Yeah. Um, um, so I wanted to pick your brand about this because you were writing these two things simultaneously. And, and, and as I said in the intro, uh, the really short version of the plot is um, the protagonist is a trumpet player who's not really happy with his playing. And a stranger approaches him and gives him a magical trumpet, and and the uh, the development starts from there. So when you were when you first had the seedlings of writing instrumental, did the music or the comic come first? And each track is sort of 
loosely corresponds to each chapter. So what was the relation, the creative relationship between those two? Yeah, well, I think like, I think like it's actually, well, it's not funny, actually. It's not funny at all. It's, it's just kind of like, um, to me, it's like a little bit serendipitous how it all came together. Mm -hmm. Like, because two of the tracks were written quite a bit, quite a ways before. Mm. Like I, I had been like internally thinking about this plot for like a few years, to be mm -hmm. honest, like just in the back of my head, like working out the machinations of the plot and the track celebration. And that's track two and track seven, best of luck were both written before I, um, before I started work on the comic. Uh, and the funny thing is those two tracks were written about two years, like two years apart from each other, hmm. but they're like the same music, right? Mm -hmm. If you listen to track two and track seven, it's like, da, 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 and then celebration is da, 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 da. So it's like the same musical idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I didn't even realize that it kind of made me feel like, oh, wow, I'm awesome. But also like, wow, I only have one idea. <laughs> like I have only ever had like one idea and I just keep writing the same stupid idea. But, um, and I thought, oops, there goes Tilly. She just jumped. Oh. I, but, uh, I just kind of thought like these, um, these two tracks like present kind of two different sides of a, of a, of two different like presentations of the same idea. Mm. And one of them is like this really frantic kind of like fevered manic version of this idea. And the other one is like really peaceful. Mm. Um, and when I was putting together the music for this project, uh, I wanted, I kind of went through a bunch of my old songs that I had written and that, that I hadn't been, that hadn't been like really fully fleshed out. And well, is there material here that I can, that will, that would work for this book? And those two tracks really stood out. Um, and the rest of the tracks are all, were all written to be sort of like, to all have a, like a lot of coherent musical mm -hmm. content that uh, fits together. Um, and so those two tracks came before and the rest of the tracks were written basically when I was working on the book. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, um, the really long track, track six, was the last one that I finished, mm -hmm. um, and it really is a culmination of like a lot of the musical ideas that happen in tracks, like tracks one and three, mm -hmm. and well, even like there's like a definitely compositional ties that tie together mm -hmm. all of it, the whole thing, right? There's some rhythmic ideas that come back throughout. There's like a really rudimentary, simple version of like a to a twelve tone row mm -hmm. that. Uh, you can that happens at various points throughout the soundtrack, and um, and you know, like, uh, you know, just and then like the 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 sound that starts the album, mm -hmm. this like really buzzy uh, major seventh of between a G flat and an F mm -hmm. uh, comes back at various points over the course of the album, right, and right. It, it represents something in the story and i don't want to i don't really want to like talk too much about like the intersection between mm -hmm. the book of course, of course uh the contents of the book right and right the and the music well we gotta leave we gotta um, leave a little something more we gotta be incentivized to buy the book after all well i think like i think it's really like up to the reader Mm -hmm. um to kind of like find their own interpretation i'm just worried if i give my interpretation that then that's like the definitive one right and then, right. If, and then people like reading it will try to like box it in that way and i've it's been really cool actually because certain people like have had little mini debates online mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. about about my book right about how the music fits in with the book right mm -hmm. how it all fits together um I don't want to like come in and be like, here's what it actually means. Yeah, I want to yeah. like let that debate happen. Um, it's, and it's just kind of cool to see like uh, different interpretations of it. Uh, and obviously like um, there's a little bit of like a problem is that like everyone reads at a different pace. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. one of the joy of reading a comic is that you can take your time and take spend as much time looking at one panel as you want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're not really stuck for, by the constriction of time like you are when you listen to listen to music. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they comics and music both share this like temporal aspect, this aspect of like time. You ha- you can't take in a comic book without time. You can't listen to music without time. And I just and so much. And then when you when you look at like kind of what, well, what happens with Tom in the mm-hmm. book, I think like, um, not to like to dive too much into like an explanation, like a, like me kind of explaining too much, but like, there is like a time, a temporal aspect of what's happening. And so just kind of like trying to make it so that the form fits the content so right, that like right. the art, like the con, like the, the comics container, Right. Becomes right. part of the content of the comic story. And then like the music container somehow reflects that as well. I, I was just about to <laughs> sort of echo that sentiment. I think it's really cool how both the album and the book sort of parallel each other in how they use time. And you you, know, you mentioned when you were writing the book, you've mentioned that, you know, this in our discussions before, how you, you use the panels in a very restrictive rigorous way and you only break those in in certain instances i don't i don't want to give too much away but the the other parallel that i think is really interesting that we've uh discussed before is this and so to me as someone who's jewish i found this really interesting you bit you discussed how comics and jazz are essentially these parallel art forms where uh, jazz was this art form created by this subjugated community, the African American community, and comic books mm-hmm. were this the same sort of art form for another subjugated community. At least, community, at least, like Jews. I would say, like at least, like superhero comic books in America, mm. right, mm-hmm. are is definitely like created by like Jewish Americans, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's definitely a comic history that goes beyond America, like. Mm-hmm. Japan has a huge, obviously an enormous like comics history. Belgium Mm -hmm. are like the four big countries. I hope I'm not forgetting anything, but like the four big countries that have a comic history and like in America for sure, there's like Jewish American comics have a Jewish American like heritage that Mm -hmm. that's really important. I think is really important. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, in the same way that like, uh, like, creating a like a like a modern mythology for like mm-hmm. uh like aspirational mythology for people who have been subjugated in a lot of ways like the the jazz world uh not that it's mythological but like mm-hmm. these the these like black american jazz artists um were like like aspirational figures for the black american community that had been like subjugated and brutalized by like the status quo for so long um i don't know i mean it's a maybe i i don't want to like i don't want to like um hit the hit it too hard on the head Mm -hmm. like because i'm neither like jewish or Mm -hmm. black so i don't want to speak for like the these entire enormous like groups of people but like but i just think that it's fascinating to look at these parallel histories and kind of um kind of like see like the to quote like the name of mingus's autobiography it's like the triumph of the underdog Mm -hmm. you know i really have a soft spot in my heart like i'm a minnesota timberwolves fan you know (laughs) like i have a soft spot in my heart for like the underdog yeah Yeah. uh i love i love like an underdog story yeah Yeah. and um and in a lot of ways i think like jazz and comics culturally are like historically have been like at various points in time have been have been seen as like low art mm-hmm. when it's obvious that the people making the art are making like genius high mm-hmm. art uh, where, but like the lay person or the zeitgeist cultural, like zeitgeist at large, it will still look at it and be like, that's low art. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look at like the works, of the, the, the work of like, shoot, I don't even know, like, like even something like a newspaper comic, like crazy cat mm-hmm. or, or like the work of like Jack Kirby Mm-hmm. Um, this is like high art and obviously like all these black American jazz artists like Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong all the way like 
all the way through, these guys are making amazing high art. It's like brilliant high art. I don't know. I mean, even this high and low art distinction is kind of dumb. The the other um, thing that you mentioned in an early response that I wanted to touch on is people are having these debates online about what each each section means. And it's been cool for me to follow your work and see what kind of response instrumental has gotten a you, list goes on you've had an article on downbeat you had a glowing review from dave douglas and I, it's totally deserved i personally believe and this is my opinion here that instrumental and its corresponding soundtrack are the most interesting thing happening in jazz is the most interesting thing happening in jazz right now and for you kind of sitting back after working on this project for so long and then sitting on it for a couple years, what does it feel like to just have all of this positive feedback and this press and dare I say notoriety come your way? Oh man. It's uh, first off, like, I, like a lot of is, is really interesting stuff happening in jazz music. That's not my stuff. So, so first off, I'm not going to agree with you. <laughs> That this is like I wouldn't expect you out to. of this work. I'm yeah. really happy with it, but like there, there's no way that I'm gonna say like yes, this is, um, you know. But it, it's it's a unique thing. It's a unique, it's a unique thing, um, and I think it I think it works. Uh, I, what was your question again? Well, how does it feel getting what getting the all this attention and all this notoriety? Oh and, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know what, man? I it's it's a uh, it's a little bit it's it's totally satisfying. It's cool. Mm. It's it's inspiring. Like it makes me like want to like make more art. You know, mm -hmm. it's good. It's 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 exciting. Like um to get some like positive. It's always exciting to get positive affirmation. But like, I feel a little bit like I don't want to sound like arrogant or anything. But I feel like. I, I always believed in this work. I, I've mm -hmm. always been like, this is like a really cool project. And at the same time, I can fully recognize that it's a big project. It's like an expensive project. And, and I understand why a publisher might hesitate. Um, and so when I was like working on it, I was pitching it to publishers and like literary agents, like the kind of people who get, you publishing deals and stuff like that. And a lot of publishers said the same thing, like seriously, like five or six publishers said, this was beautiful. We love it, but we're not going to put it out, but mm -hmm. someone will put it out. Mm -hmm. And they assured me like, someone's going to pick this up and put it out. And thankfully, uh, like Z2 comics, Josh Frankel and, um, and street ready, his business partner, uh, like co-publisher, they they like have had a real vision and really understood like it, and it lined up with my vision for this book mm -hmm. that like the music and the comics become like this like you, it becomes a at the very least like it becomes like a nice marketing angle mm -hmm. uh if not like a satisfying like artistic experience right a satisfying piece of media for people to kind of like consume or whatever. And, um, so thankfully those guys, those guys kind of looked at this and saw the potential in it. And at this point, like, I think every, everyone involved is pretty like overjoyed with the, with how, how it's doing. You know, I don't know that if, if anyone's expectations were like flying through the roof that this would get like, like, look, put it this way. Like, it's an ex it's a pretty expensive book mm -hmm. to buy, and probably most people ha who bought it haven't heard of me, right? Like, I'm an unknown name, and I'm pretty like I have a few published comics under my belt. I have a couple albums under my belt, but like nothing has been really high profile, and that's fine. I'm not like complaining about that or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a lot to ask for someone to go to into a store, pick up this book, and be like, spend twenty five dollars on someone you've never heard of, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so and so it it it, I think it's beaten it's beaten it's surpassed people's expectations in that regard. Like, um, that 
that, uh, you know, something about it hit caught on with enough people to buy it. And kind of like the word of mouth has been strong, yeah, yeah. I think, with this book. And yeah, yeah, it's been it's been really exciting. Well, very, uh, very cool, man. Uh, I want to get you out on this one last question. Um, you know, you mentioned you've been okay. you've been able to live the bohemian lifestyle and you're you're a multi-talented guy you (laughs) draw you play trumpet you sing you play guitar piano you you do all this stuff and you you do a lot of original stuff as well so do you have any advice for anyone who's looking to create original art whether it's comics paintings music do you have any advice for anyone listening oh of course i do yes i have like lots of advice lots of i would say like um, first thing is like, you have to love the process of making it. Mm-hmm. It's the same advice that Tom gets in the book from Rhett, I think in the, con- like the conversation, you have to love the process. If you don't love the process, if you don't love practicing, if you don't love drawing every day, drawing the same thing over and over again, whatever you're doing, if you don't love it, it's going to be a really an uphill battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is don't, uh, don't be a perfectionist, right? Mm -hmm. Perfectionism is, is the enemy, right? In in particular, while you're creating, like let the creation happen and then step back two weeks later and look at it and say, Oh, can I improve on this maybe? Or is it worth it? Uh, Learn from your mistakes and move forward. It's better to have, it's better to finish work Mm -hmm. and, learn from it than to continually revise one thing mm-hmm. over years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Dave, for, Dave, for Pete. Mm-hmm. Go, mm-hmm. Ahead. Go ahead. Oh, the, the other thing is, uh, like, like the, don't wait for someone to give you permission to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, a lot of people are like waiting for permission to record an album. They're waiting for permission to make a comic. They, um, and you, do any of this stuff is to do it and learn from making mistakes and stuff like that. Uh, so anyway, that's those, I guess those are my biggest pieces of, of advice, you know, love mm-hmm. the process. Mm-hmm. Um, don't be a perfectionist. And then, um, like, don't wait for someone to give you permission. All right, Dave, thank you so much for your time, man. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. All right. To end this segment, what track from instrumental would you like us to play? Uh, how about, do you want like a really long track? Should we do like, let's do track six. Okay, perfect. The The summation summation of all the themes. themes. That's That's wonderful. wonderful. This is, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Dave, thanks so much. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Dan.
find out more about Katie Burns, go to her music at katieburns.com. There you can find more about her, her talk, and her music. Like to learn more about Katie Hurst and Kunsan. If you'd like to learn more or to purchase her music, please visit katiehurst.com. If you'd like to learn more about Katie Hurst, go to her website at katiehurstmusic.com. There you can also purchase little words and records from Twinkle. If you'd like to know more about Dave Chisholm, or if you want to purchase instrumental and the soundtrack, please visit DaveChismMusic.com. Katie Ernst can be described as a triple threat, a great singer, songwriter, and bassist. Originally from Naperville, Illinois, Katie has made a name for herself playing in Chicago. Now, she has released a couple great albums, a solo album called Little Words featuring the poetry of Dorothy Parker and she's also released a couple albums with her band Twin Talk. We have a chance to talk to Katie about what it means to be a woman songwriter bassist, a little bit about her music and the life of Dorothy Parker. Katie, thank you for joining the podcast today. Hey, thanks for having me. So when did you first become interested in a uh, in jazz in general and we'll get into the bass and singing later, but what was your first introduction into the jazz world? Well, I kind of stumbled upon jazz music when I was in elementary school, and my parents didn't really like jazz, so my first jazz CD that they bought for me was a compilation that they got at like the grocery store, and it was called Jazz <laughs> for When You're Alone, um, <laughs> because they figured I would be alone <laughs> when I was listening to it. Um, but I, I think I found it at the library or the, you know, someone said something and I decided that I liked it. So it was very impulsive. Mm-hmm. And uh, what what was on that CD that, that got you hooked? I Actually, that CD was super boring. It was all these really drowsy ballads. Um, so I just would like go to sleep with it on. Uh, but yeah. I remember really liking this compilation CD that had some things like Billie Holiday singing Solitude and um, this... Dizzy Gillespie song mm. that, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. But there was all these like little snippets of, of things that I really liked and I would listen to on repeat a lot in my alone time. So if your parents didn't like jazz, what what was the, uh, the musical environment like uh, around you where you were from that kind of kept the engine going and kept your interest in jazz up? Well, I went to the Naperville Public Schools through high school, and there was a string program and a jazz band, and um, so I'd say, like, public education music scene really kept my interest uh, peaked, and Mm. I also got some little scholarships to go to summer music camps through the parent and teacher organization um, at my junior high, so that kind of fed the the interest throughout the summers and um, helped me figure out that it was something I was serious about. And so when, what, what, what drew you to the base? Mm, another impulse. Uh, <laughs> so classic day to try out all the instruments and mm-hmm. all the girls were lined up to play the flute and all of the boys were lined up to play the drums and mm-hmm. being cool. I was going to try both the flute and the drums. But there wasn't enough time because the lines were really long. So after failing Mm. at the flute, because I thought you just blew into it, um, (laughs) I was like, let me just cut my losses and find the shortest line. And there was no one in line to play the double bass because that thing That's just upsetting. Yeah. So um, the sweet man showed me how to play hot cross buns. And I thought, Mm. I'm pretty good at this. I can already play a song. So I signed up for it and had to explain to my mom what a double bass was when I got home. <laughs> I bet that was a fun conversation. 
yeah, she was like, what is this? <laughs> uh, a big violin. So Exactly. Uh, the strings are in opposite order, but, you know, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, what then, so was singing sort of parallel with that? Were you singing at about the same time you were learning to pick up the bass? I, I mean, I sang in all the school choir things, and um, I would sing with my family in church, and I... Mm-hmm. I there was I took some piano lessons when I was before I started playing the bass and Mm -hmm. the the piano teacher had us sing some things and play some things to help learn how to Mm. read music and she mentioned to my mom that I had a pleasant singing voice um and I think that was enough confidence that I just was like okay I sing you know like I can do that um Mm -hmm. and then I I got into jazz singing later and when I went to high school uh so i kind okay. of so, fused those a little later so we'll we'll kind of come back around to uh your evolution and progressing it in both but who are your some of your early influences and some of the first musicians you really dug i mean you i know you mentioned you really liked billy holiday on those compilation cds but who are some bassists and other vocalists you were looking up to when you first started off and how did you try to emulate them Mm. I really liked Charles Mingus. Um, I had mm. the library had Mingus Ah Um, um and there yeah. was an energy to the music that was kind of mind blowing, um, mm-hmm. and it was such a like such clear, strong statements. Um, and I was, I mean, super young, so I didn't really know like the ex- the depth of which this music <laughs> carries um right. but but something just off of you know first impressions it felt important um and it felt i liked how it f- the groove felt and and charles mingus's sound and all of that um and there was also a a super bass set of albums mm-hmm. that um was ray brown john clayton and christian mcbride and that oh. kind of turned me upside down because i didn't realize that the bass could take on any role and not just Mm -hmm. the the foundation so on that record they it's just three bass players playing Mm -hmm. together and they play chords they play melodies they play bass lines it's it's super fun and it's a live record so it all was in real time yeah and uh so who were some of your uh vocalists besides billy holiday that you were listening to and sort of developed around Let's see. Uh, I kind of like the Heartbreakers. I liked Billy Holiday mm. and I liked Chet Baker's sound a lot. Mm. Um, Na- uh, Nancy Wilson crept up a little bit later, um, but mm-hmm. I definitely geeked out a lot on, on Billy Holiday and Chet Baker at the very beginning. So. Yeah, and uh, so you mentioned you were you getting you'd been singing for a while, but you got more into being a jazz vocalist in high school. Is that when the uh, the bug sort of bit you that you knew you wanted? to do music going forward and as a career? That part is a little blurry for me. Um, I think Mm. I was always really serious about music. And in some ways I can, I can say, yeah, I kind of knew earlier on even that that was something that I wanted to do, but in like the specifics of it or the, you know, that decision to go to music school, um, that was probably, probably when that question was really asked in high school of like, what, what do you want to major in or where do you want to go next? Um, so I, but I think that my, um, kind of like dedication to and pursuit of music as what I would do with mm. my life kind of snowballed and built on itself year after year until it just seemed like, of course I would be looking at music schools and not other kinds of schools. So yeah. it was kind of and, a, yeah, it grew. And, and so as you were uh, deciding you wanted to do this and you were developing your chops further, I'm sure you made, you decided, oh, wait, I can sing and play the bass. I mean, was that, was that a sort of conscious deci- decision or, oh, I know how to play this. I might as well accompany myself. Yeah. I think, again, there wasn't like that aha moment of like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this together now. Um, mm-hmm. But probably even just back from the days when I was singing and playing the piano in my little nine-year-old lessons, Mm -hmm. um, it was just something that you can sing and play the bass. You know, you're you're not. There's nothing that stops you from being able to do that. Um, And and I would just, as I got 
into singing jazz, it made sense to accompany myself, um, even in just learning a song. So it kind of, they grew together pretty quickly. And d did you find that when you were in this process, both doing both at the same time, or when you were working on singing, it affected your bass lines, or when you were working on bass lines, it affected your singing? What's, for, for those of us who only play one instrument at a time, uh, what sort of learning parallelism is there when you're kind of learning these two things simultaneously? Well, in some ways it I got it, I learned how to to separate and be independent between the two functions. Mm. Um right. so kind of like, you know, splitting your brain in half. Um mm -hmm. but I also think that in being independent there's also like you learn the relationship between the two two different lines. So mm -hmm. in being able to play the bass line and sing the melody, you're automatically getting a harmonic outline. Um, mm. So it, in, yeah, it kind of like wove itself together where I think a little bit, or I, I mean, even in writing music, I think about kind of the, the relationship between melody and bass line rather than starting with chords. Um, and that's, mm. I think, an offshoot of just how I've, approached making music and learning songs and stuff i want to come back to the whole songwriting thing and especially your album little words but I, I wanted to pick your brain about something maybe even 20 years ago uh the woman singing and playing bass might not have been so much of a jazz cultural item but now i know nikki parrott's been around for a while but names like yourself katie thoreau kate davis and of course esperanza spaulding are, are doing more of being uh, the woman singer songwriter and playing the bass from someone who's sort who's in that bubble, uh, it seems at least to me that this is just is, is sort of almost a new sub genre. Uh, was I, I know you, you all didn't have a meeting and, <laughs> and then you just decided and just decided to do that, but. What it is about that combination do you think works really well and draws people in? Well, I th I think that, um, yes, we did not have a meeting. And <laughs> I, part of me wants to say that it's just a byproduct of there being more women uh, mm -hmm. in, in the creative music capacity. Or there's fewer women that have been told, no, you can't play the bass because mm. that's for a bigger person. So it's just a numbers game, really, of if there's that, if there are more women that are selecting that instrument as their vehicle, then the odds of there being people making creative music in that way, mm. it's gonna, mm -hmm. the numbers will increase. Um, and I think one of the cool things is that all of us are doing very different things with that mm. combination. And I would love for it to seem just as common as like the singer songwriter who plays guitar or piano. Mm. Um, it's, you know, it's just a, another way of accompanying yourself or another way of, you know, um, of writing music. So I, I'm hoping that it's just the beginning of something that'll just seem really common. Right. It's, and so we'll come back to around to something you mentioned earlier when when you're composing and when you're songwriting you don't think of it in terms of chords you think of it in terms of the melody and the bass line so i i, I want to take a couple minutes to talk about your first solo release i believe uh little words i i total personal bias here not representative of what outside in music thinks but i really enjoyed this album I've, I've had the opportunity to play it on the radio a couple times and I, I wanted to pick your brain about it so i think that the first thing that that comes to mind is in the liner notes it's poetry by and so can you tell us a, a little bit about how you came across uh this poet and her work and how you decided to make it into a jazz album sure um, so Little Words is a project that I did using the poetry of Dorothy Parker, um, mm -hmm. and I set that poetry to music um, and recorded it. So I um, it started with uh, another moment of serendipity where I had mm -hmm. written a song at Eastman as part of mm -hmm. a composition class, and it felt to me like that song could have words. <laughs> yeah, um, I wasn't at the point where I felt comfortable with writing lyrics um, or sharing lyrics that I had written. 
And so, mm-hmm. like a desperate millennial, I googled short <laughs> poems and hoped that the internet would solve my problems. Mm. And it it did. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just I had I was just like I I was sifting through sand. There was nothing. Um, Mm. really logical about this, but I ended, I stumbled upon this poem by Dorothy Parker, who I had never heard of in, Mm -hmm. um, before that. And the, the, the meter of it and the rhyme scheme kind of fit my pre-written song really well. So Mm. I copy pasted and, um, and it felt good for the first time to have written something that I could also sing and express. Um, and Dorothy Parker writes a lot of kind of witting, witty, biting, uh, mm. you know, uh, men are terrible and I'm crazy to <laughs> care and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's great college age mm. fodder. Um, it's also a great breakup album if anyone needs one. Um, but it. Uh, it felt good to sing something that I had, music that I had written and an environment, mm-hmm. a musical environment that I had created. Um and have that all be merged together because I had only been singing standards. Um, Mm -hmm. So that started, it kind of like turned a light bulb on of, I can write music that I also sing. Um, Mm -hmm. And Dorothy Parker has so many beautiful poems that are very singable in in their length and in how they read um, that I just kind of slowly started accruing a collection of these. Um, And then I, a few years later, I recorded all of them um, to make little words. Hmm. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about who Dorothy Parker is? Sure. Um, so she was. Uh, she did a lot of things. She was a poet. She was a, a theater critic in New York. She was a part of the Algonquin Roundtable, which was this group hmm. of snarky wordplay, uh, like cultural folks that got together and um, were very uh, posh and and hip. Um, she moved to California and wrote for TV and film for a long time. Um, she mm. just lived this kind of wild life of, of many different phases of her life, having all different kinds of um, activities. Um, mm-hmm. And But her poetry books, um, she didn't write very many of them, but they were really, really well received um enough mm-hmm. rope and sunset gun are two of them and uh just that her tone and style i think has kind of influenced pretty much all modern uh writing <laughs> in yeah. if you think about like groupons and the descriptions of them and how they're kind of like <laughs> court you know like they're they're clever and conversational yeah. and um I feel like that's totally just ripping off Dorothy Parker because she just had um, kind of like real smart conversation um, as opposed to like the super gooey prose of before her right. time. Um, so she's kind of a fascinating person that that spans a lot of decades that is worth checking out. Um, and fun fact, if I may ramble about Dorothy Parker for a moment, is that she was uh, super... Um, she was really kind of hard she didn't connect well with people on a personal level Hmm. she'd always like talk bad about you behind your back um she kind of kept her distance from people emotionally but she was really active in social justice causes um Mm -hmm. and like raised money for anti-fascism before it was a cool thing to do um Hmm. and what is involved in the civil rights movement and uh animal rights and all these different kind of like bigger global showing that she had a heart um, and when she died, she willed all of her estate and everything to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, mm. And then stipulated that in mm. the event of his death, all of her stuff should go to the NAACP. So I actually licensed mm. all of her work from the NAACP. Um, wow. Even though she had never met Martin Luther King and you know, he was like, I don't, that's great. Thanks for supporting the cause. <laughs> um, <laughs> but she was just, she was just kind of a, an odd, oddball woman who did a lot of, um, great things on a lot of different levels but also was kind of a tragic character and that she couldn't really connect with people so um yeah. that's dorothy parker she's fascinating uh, thank you much really appreciate that. that that was a nice summary and this might be the nerdiest thing i ever say on record but uh i took i took a uh, I took ap latin and there was a Latin poet named Marshall who wrote in a very similar witty conversational style. So if you're looking for mo- more poetry, don't forget to Google Dorothy Parker and Marshall uh, while you're at it. So I, I want to uh, wrap up 
another quick thing about little words before we move on to something else. I, I think what, because it's poetry and it, even if it a poet a poem isn't exactly um, thematically connected, because it's by the same person, there's this really common thread. And I think what Little Words does very well is it plays like a jazz song cycle. So when you were putting all of these things together, did you have it in mind to kind of create this more common harmonic and rhythmic themes between them all? Or is this just something that came out naturally when you were discovering your songwriting? Mm. I definitely wrote each one individually. Um, mm. And w with the the focus being to serve whatever the specific tone or message of the poem was. Um, mm. I had written most of them before I even knew I w it was going to be a project project. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say that the any continuity in tone is because Dorothy Parker is a um, a brilliant woman whose voice kind of carries. <laughs> um, right. And um, yeah, so I mean, they were definitely it. It resulted in a song cycle, um, and I also spent a lot of time trying to figure out the right flow of track order and all of that. Mm. Um, so that was, in, yeah, it was curated, but it wasn't curated before the music was written. So, gotcha. Now, in that album, uh, little words are were the drummer and saxophone player of your current and your bros band Twin Talk. Can you talk about uh, these two dudes, how you met them, and uh, what Twin Talk is about as a band? Sure. Um, so uh, my most trusted musical allies are Andrew Green on drums and Dustin Lorenzi on saxophone. Mm. And we started a band about over five years ago uh, called mm -hmm. Twin Talk. And we really, the goal of that band was to really understand how we play together. Um, mm. and to really dig deep into the communication that between musicians as being the mm -hmm. main priority. And so when I was floating the idea of doing a solo project, um, it felt really natural to involve the people that I most <laughs> closely communicate and trust. Um, yeah. um, so I also invited a pianist who lives in... New York named Samora Pinderhues to round out the the group for Little mm. Words, um, and he and I met when I did a, a residency program at the Kennedy Center called Betty Carter's Jazz Ahead, and mm -hmm. um, so we had kind of met and learned about each other's songwriting and styles and stuff, and so he came in to to help with that project, um, but yeah, it's I I would say that finding musicians that really understand your vision um but also mm. have their own voice was something mm -hmm. that was really crucial especially for a first project being able to feel like you're um being understood and trusted <laughs> in in yeah. how you want something to to play out so i'm um, very and grateful if, if i'm not mistaken the name twin talk comes from uh it's sort of this psychological term where a pair of twins will actually in, while they're learning their own native language of their parents they sort of also come up with their own language and so that's that's kind of what twin talk is it, that, that's what it is in the psychological realm but for you you sort of attribute it to the chemistry and the way you guys communicate in the band right yeah um twin talk being like this really personal high level communication that um has a lot of shorthand and a lot of um yeah like that that level <laughs> where you can look at someone yeah. and be like oh it's time to go <laughs> or right. like oh we're gonna do this now um so right. yeah the idea of that that really personal level of communication and and developing a language that's unique to a smaller group of people is twin talk so uh twin talk has released two albums correct and then there are two on the way right uh, yes, there's one Twin Talk record on the way, and there's also, I have a new project with a clarinet player named James Falzone that's coming out soon, too. So I've very, got a lot of things happening. Well, very cool. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the your latest Twin Talk record? Give, it, give a shout out to your bros, what we're working on. Sure. Um, we're still, we uh, recently recorded, we tracked, um, so that will be coming out 
probably in a year, year and a half. Um, and, uh, but in the meantime, we put a record out in 2016. So last year in April, um, mm -hmm. that's self-titled. It's called twin talk. And, um, it's got a lot of, uh, it's got a lot of music on it that we still play live. Um, and that we've been touring with. So, uh, we've got, yeah, some old and some new in our live shows, which is great. Okay. Katie, thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Uh, to end your segment, uh, is there anything you'd like us to play from little words? Oh man. Uh, I will invite the last question, which is the, the final song on the album for you guys to check out. Okay. Katie, thanks. You, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. New love, new love, where are you to lead me? All along a narrow way that marks a crooked line. How are you to slake me, and how are you to feed me? With bitter yellow berries and a sharp new wine. New love, new love, shall I be forsaken? One shall go a-wandering, one of us must die. Sweet it is to slumber, but how shall we awaken? Whose will be the broken heart when dawn comes by? Whose will be the broken heart when dawn comes by?
This is Dan Gross on Extended Harmony, the monthly podcast that is produced in conjunction with Over Here, the weekly podcast hosted by Outside In Music's founder, Nick Finzer. Extended Harmony features musicians in the jazz, blues, and soul umbrella who create original music. This week, we talked to Danny Rabin of Marbin, Mike Catone of Holophoner, Dave Chisholm, who wrote, drew, and composed the soundtrack for a new comic book instrumental, and Katie Ernst of Twin Talk. And you can find more information about them through our website, OutsideInMusic.com. Thank you to my guests, Nick Finzer, and of course, you for listening, whether you're at home or on the road. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs>